pray together. <clears throat> Loving God, we come together in your house to worship you. We come once more reminded of all that you have done for your people gathered here this morning. We thank you for your love that surrounds us and for the grace that you have shown us through Jesus Christ. Dear Father, we come to offer you our praise and our thanks in response to your goodness. We come before you to bring our heartfelt worship. Help us to forget about ourselves and just concentrate on you. Help us to put aside that which should come between us at this holy hour. Almighty God, we remember your faithfulness and because of that we are made more conscious of our faithlessness. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us for the smallness of our vision and our carelessness in discipleship. Father, forgive our faults and failings and help us to seek you, your way and not ours. Forgive us all the opportunities that we have missed and for all that we could have done and should have done but failed to do. Reassure us now of your continued forgiveness and mercy, we pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your assurance we have that you are always with us. In you we find the help and strength in times of trouble. Whatever we face, you are always there to reach out to save us. Father God, we thank you that you are present just here but everywhere and that no one is outside your love or beyond your concern. Almighty God, thank you that for take our faith, weak as it is, kindle the spark of life within us and fan a new flame of love within our hearts. May we set out into another week with renewed purpose. Help us, Lord, to live and work for you. Assure us that we are with you are with us in all the week that we do. And now let's join together with the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Old Testament reading is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 to 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him, for this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But if a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. And a New Testament reading is taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 21. 25. He went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, 
not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in the synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading of his holy word. Thanks to Catherine and to Margaret. Let's sing once again. Be still for the glory. Be still <laughs> for the glory of the Lord. And number 189. I forgot my lines there. <laughs> Wouldn't you? 
lots and lots and lots of figures. Any accountants in the room? One. <laughs> what else? A typist. Any typists in the room? I'm thinking about something else now. When you said keyboard, because I'm thinking, who would be the best teacher for the things that you spoke about? Who would be the best teacher for learning a keyboard? Gina? God? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've got to play the keyboard. <laughs> I suppose God could play the keyboard. Jesus, I don't know if the keyboards were around at that time, but I'm sure you'd have a right good go. I was maybe thinking more along the lines of Stephen. <laughs> Stephen's now not a museum. Hi, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, if I, I know after listening, how good was that last time? How good did that sound? I know that if I wanted to learn the keyboard, which I'm absolutely rubbish, by the way, I would go to Stephen, because that was marvellous the way he played it. If you wanted to learn maths and to be an accountant, you could go and see Elaine, couldn't you? Elaine could teach. Yeah? yeah. What else? What about, I was thinking about if you wanted to make things out of wood, who would you go and ask if you... Yes, carpenter. a carpenter. Yes, so you would probably go and ask a carpenter. Because I like to say a carpenter, that's what I was thinking about. He would probably spend lots and lots of hours measuring and sawing and nailing pieces of wood together, wouldn't he? That's what he would do for a living. So every single day he would, he would get pieces of wood out and he would saw them and he would nail them together. And I don't know about you, who's tried to hammer a nail into a piece of wood? <laughs> Who got it right first time? <laughs> <laughs> Who bent the nail? <laughs> Who missed the nail altogether? <laughs> Who lost their own nail? <laughs> that sometimes happens, you see. Sometimes you swing the hammer. Hand you miss. Because you see the, the carpenter doing it and it looks so easy. But he works with authority. He works with wood with the authority that he can then show others. So rather than me just picking up a hammer and try to put a nail into a piece of wood on my own, it probably would have been smarter if I had went and spoke to someone who does it every single day. Like so if you were going to be play the keyboard and you wanted to learn that, you would go to Stephen. You wouldn't just pick up a keyboard and play it because Probably wouldn't sound the best. But after what, a good half hour were you, Stephen? <laughs> Chopin. <laughs> Chopin, you would be. Yeah. Okay, what's that? <laughs> Nobody knows. But you would learn, they would be able to teach you because people who play, who do things all the time, they teach with authority and then they, they know how to teach others. So when Jesus lived on earth, he was a teacher. Yeah? And the people who heard them were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as having authority. Jesus taught people not how to play the keyboard. Not even to be a carpenter, but he could have. Because Jesus went into carpentry the same as his dad Joseph. So Jesus was a carpenter. But Jesus taught about the love of God. Because people could see by the things that he did, the things that he said that he taught with authority. They watched as Jesus healed a man who had an unclean spirit and they saw the power of God's love. You see, the best teachers are the ones who really know what they're talking about. Jesus is the best teacher to teach us about love. So we're going to pray Oh, after me, prayer. Oh, taught you so well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Who shows us. How to receive and share. How to receive and share. Your healing love. Your healing love. Even when things get messy. 
human things get easy. Thank you and Amen. Thank you and Amen. And we're going to sing again. This is going to bring it all back. Hymn number 564, Jesus Loves Me. John the Baptist had been arrested. Now when Jesus heard that John the Baptist was in prison, he left Nazareth and moved to Capernaum, where he called his disciples and he started his ministry. According to Mark, he got off to a quick start. The first Sabbath he was there, he went to the synagogue and he taught. Now Mark says the elders were astounded at his teaching because he taught as one with authority and not as their scribes. So, so far, so good. But then trouble begins. Mark says, just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Who was this man with the unclean spirit? Well, Mark doesn't say. But the very fact that he's there in the synagogue suggests he probably was one of their regulars. He may even have been one of the elders. We don't know. We can assume, though, simply because he appears not to have stood out in any way 
that he looked and acted like everyone else, reverent, righteous and respectable. So exactly what kind of unclean spirit did he have then? Again, we don't know this, and this is where we are apt to get off track. You see, to speak of an unclean spirit is normally to suggest being possessed by a demon of some sort, and then that conjures up images of a poltergeist who saw the movie. People with wild eyes, bad hair, well, some of them have green stuff spewing out of their mouths, deranged people who belong in cages or late night horror movies. Now let's face it, if someone sat in this congregation with wild eyes and with green stuff spewing out their mouths, I think someone may mention it. <laughs> I have a feeling that they may, they may just stand out. No, no matter how big a Saturday night they've had, I think they would still stand out. And call me old fashioned, but I don't think I'd ever have any of those becoming an elder or hold any position within this church. So is it possible this unclean spirit spoken of by Mark is nothing like the poltergeist spirit that we automatically think of? And instead is, is something a little closer to home for many of us? So, keeping that in mind, what I'd like for us to think about in the sermon this morning is that this man that Jesus confronted might not have been all that different from us. And the unclean spirit he had might have been something that we can all identify with. If so, I'm hoping that by naming some of the spirits that commonly afflict us, we'll be drawn that much closer to the spirit of the living God in Jesus Christ. Listen again to what the man said. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I'd say this man in the gospel story had probably an overly protective spirit. He sounds like someone who can see the writing on the wall. That it wouldn't be long before this Jesus who taught them as having authority and not as the scribes would soon shake the foundations of the faith and upset their comfortable little ways of doing things. If I were guessing, I'd say he may even be one of the scribes, someone who had the most to lose and therefore the most to protect. And that may surprise a few people. Someone who would, who, who would have been thought of as good and as righteous and as faithful, someone like that surely cannot have an unclean spirit. During training for ministry, you get to hear all sorts of stories told to you by supervisors. <coughs> Ministers who are very experienced and who are very good at relating to all sorts of issues that they've experienced over their time as ministers in various parishes. One such story went a bit like this. This minister had an elder with what the minister liked to call an overly protective spirit. It seems he considered himself one of the last remaining guardians of the one true faith. His father had been a long time Presbyterian minister. For him, the true faith was what he remembered his father doing and his father saying. So he took it upon himself to stand guard, watching for any signs of heresy, then exposing them first to the heretic, which in this case was the minister, then to everyone else who would listen to him. 
You see, this minister had decided to introduce a service of renewal of baptismal vows. The session had given approval, and the service then went ahead. It went well. More than half of the congregation came forward that morning when the invitation was given. <coughs> but when the minister went back to the vestry after the service was over, that elder was there waiting on him. You've crossed the line this time, he said, with fire in his eyes. That was clearly <coughs> unprecedented. The minister tried to explain that the service had been taken straight from a book of common author. But the elder was not interested. And if he'd had his way, the minister would have been looking for a new charge that very afternoon. The minister was quick to tell me, though, that that elder wasn't a bad person. <coughs> On the contrary, he was a respected member of the community, a lifelong member of the church, a man of faith, a man of integrity, someone that you would be honoured to know. <coughs> and when the minister finally did move, he parted his friends. They were never going to see eye to eye in things, but they parted as lovers in Christ. That elder could be described as having an unclean spirit. He was overly protective of the faith, and in his zealousness to safeguard the church <coughs> from heretics like the minister, he stood in the way of the gospel that offers new life and with it new expressions of praise and new expressions of worship. That's just one example. He gave me other examples of what he called unclean spirits, but I'll keep those stories for other sermons. But hopefully you get my point. Unclean spirits are part of everyday life. We see them all the time. They lurk within us all and about us all. They look the spirit of the man in the synagogue that day. They stand in the way of God's grace and God's love. The only way to get rid of the unclean spirits is to be honest with ourselves and to recognise them and to name them. Do you have a contentious spirit? Or a spirit of animosity? Or a controlling spirit? Or a spirit of jealousy? We must all be honest with ourselves because these are attitudes and behaviours that will <coughs> ultimately kill the church <coughs> and we've all seen it happen. The first step in getting rid of them is to bring them out into the open. You see unclean spirits, they're like cockroaches. When you shine a light on them, they scatter and run for their life. Jesus put it this way, for everyone who does evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light lest his works would be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his works may be revealed that they have been done in God. Name the unclean spirit. That is the first step. The second step is to replace them. Replace them with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The unclean spirits and the Holy Spirit are incompatible. You can either have one or other, but not both. And this is the good news. When the Spirit of Jesus Christ fills your mind and fills your heart, the unclean spirit within you has to go. And when it goes, Visible transformation occurs. So before we wrap up this morning, I'd like to invite you to name the unclean spirits you may have seen around here. Are you happy with the way things are here? Do you think we could connect better with the world around us, for example? Or have we become complacent? 
está abajo. Han crucificado. Y todos ustedes. As I said, we need, we must be honest with ourselves. We need to name it and then ask God to give us a new spirit of determination and resolve to expand our mission work. Of course, I could be completely wrong and everyone may be happy. If not, then I invite you to name the unclean spirits you see lurking around here. To see where we're at it, name the unclean spirits in your own heart. Paul said the fruit of God's Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does that fit you? Is this the way your best friend would describe you to others? The secret to driving out the unclean spirits is to name them and replace them with the Spirit of God. And that, and that alone leads to transformation. The change may be immediate, or it may be gradual, as level by level you become more Christ-like. Either way, when the Spirit of the living God comes into your heart, the unclean spirits will scatter, and you will feel like a new man or a new woman. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing once again, hymn number 550, as the deer plants for the Lord. <coughs>
Apostle God, you sent Jesus to teach people firsthand the power of your love, grace and authority. Jesus washed away unclean spirits and performed countless other miracles so that even the faithless would experience your love. You call us to be mindful and vigilant of the extraordinary miracles that you continue to work in our lives today. May our offering uphold and strengthen ministries that show others your miraculous love, grace and authority. Most holy friend, saviour of those who call on you, please give us more of the compassion and authority of Jesus. Embolden us to heal the multiple diseases that afflict humanity and drive out the demons that afflict our contemporary world. Hear us, O oh God. And loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. <coughs> Send your agents to lands that lie under darkness and oppression, where governments are corrupt, justice is rare, abuse is endemic and the weak and the poor have nowhere to turn for help. And please increase the spiritual authority of the Red Cross, Amnesty and Christian World Service to more adequately become your ready channels of compassion, justice, aid, reconciliation and peace. Hear us, O oh God. And loving God in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your messengers to situations where diseases like AIDS are reaping a grim harvest. Especially we pray for the afflicted nations of Africa and Asia. Please give authority to people to discipline compassion, to provide pharmaceutical help, nursing care and better health education drive out the demons of superstition. Hear us, O oh God. And loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your servants into places where food is scarce and crops are poor. Please strengthen the authority of those local leaders and advisors who seek to empower the people to conserve water to dig new wells, to plant trees, to grow new food crops and better, obtain better prices for their goods. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your human angels of mercy into situations both here and abroad where there is neglect, illness, sorrow, frustration and anger. Please give some of the compassionate authority of Jesus to chaplains in hospitals and prisons, to nurses and to ambulance staff, physicians and surgeons, social workers and foster parents, police officers and counsellors. Hear us, O oh God, and loving God in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. Send your gifts of comfort and great joy among the many congregations of your church. May more of the spiritual authority of Jesus empower every ordinary church member and the wisdom and compassion of Jesus enlarge the ministries of lay leaders and ordained ministers. By the grace of Christ, may our deeds more adequately match our creeds and our love expand to embrace those, those people who appear lonely and unlovable. Hear us, O oh God. And loving God, in your abundant grace, hear our prayers. God, most holy, in your mercy may we go from strength to strength in things of the Spirit and become the lovers and the agents of that holy awe which is the beginning of true wisdom. We pray all of this through Jesus Christ our Lord.
We sing together our closing hymn, hymn number 468, Son of God, Eternal Saviour. <laughs> Son and Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore.